Hello, and welcome to Linear Algebra. This is lecture 19. Today's topic is coordinates. So last time, we talked about the rank nullity theorem. Right, which remember says that if you have a linear map between two vector spaces and you start out with a finite dimensional space, then the rank of T, which is the dimension of its image, plus the nullity of T, which is the dimension of its null space or kernel, is equal to the dimension of V. This time, we're going to talk about something rather different. the coordinates of a vector in a given basis. Okay, so we're used to thinking about coordinates when we're talking about Fn, like Rn or something like that. A vector in Rn has uh, n coordinates and they are real numbers, right? So let's take a look at that. When we write a vector in Fn as a column and we say, oh, well, it has coordinates x1, x2, up to xn, really what we're saying is that this vector is equal to x1 times e1 plus x2 times e2 and so on, till you get to xn, en. Where, of course, e1 through en is the standard basis of fn, right? So e1, as you recall, is the vector whose first coordinate is one and all the other coordinates are zero. So when we take x1, e1, we're just getting the first coordinate equal to x1. And we're not saying anything about the other coordinates, right? Then when we take x2, e2, well, e2 has a one in the second coordinate and zero everywhere else. So this just gives us the second coordinate there and doesn't touch the rest of the vector. So saying that this vector is given by this expression is the same as saying, that this vector is this linear combination of this basis. Okay. So we want to emphasize that way of thinking. Let me say that one way of thinking about this is that these coordinates are the, so this, the coordinate representation of X with respect to the standard basis. Right, which is suggestive, it brings up the possibility of representing x using a different basis. Okay, so let's, let's make that a definition. So pick a basis, let's let b be a basis. Remember, for us, a basis is a list. So it's a set with an order. So let this be a basis of a vector space V. 
for each factor u in the vector space, the coordinates of u with respect to the basis B is the unique list of scalars call them A1 through AN such that the vector U is equal to A1 V1 plus dot 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 AN VN. Okay, and then the coordinate representation So we're gonna use this notation. I'll put a box around you, well, square parentheses, and then as a sub-index, I'll put B for the basis. And this is now just going to be a vector in Fn, right? We call it the coordinate representation of U with respect to B. is, and so what we'll do is we'll put the coordinates A1 through AN, and we're just keeping track of the coefficients of the linear combination, right? So just like over here, saying that X has these coordinates in FN is the same as saying that you can write X in terms of the standard basis with these numbers as coefficients, right? So X1, E1, X2, E2, up to Xn, En, right? When we say this is the coordinate representation of the vector U with respect to the basis B, what we mean is that these entries are the coefficients of writing U as a linear combination of the elements of this basis, right? So if I give you a basis and a vector, you can always write that vector as a linear combination of the elements of the basis, right? And you can only do it in one way. So these coefficients are well-defined, right? So those coefficients are just coordinates. The, the, the coordinates in the way you would expect, they tell you exactly how to find each vector in one and only one way, right? So it's, just, it's a completely equivalent way of representing the vector space, right? So here's another way of thinking about it. We know that every vector space of dimension N is isomorphic to Fn, right? Where F is the field for the vector space, right? So this is just saying, okay, pick an isomorphism between the vector space V and the and space Fn. In that isomorphism, how, where does U get sent, right? Well, it turns out that there are many isomorphisms between V and Fn. There's one for every choice of basis. Um, Right, and we know that because we know that a basis determines a linear map. So every choice of basis is going to give us an isomorphism here, and um, and this is just the image of U with respect to that isomorphism. Right. So let me write a sentence about that. If V is in, let's go ahead and say an n-dimensional vector space over F with basis B, then representing 
vectors in coordinates, the coordinates that you get from this basis gives us an explicit isomorphism, say C sub B from V to Fn between V and Fn, right? So of course, this is just the map where you give me a vector U and I just represent it in the coordinates of the basis. So I end up with a vector in Fn, right? So I just wanna emphasize that the vector U gives you a vector in Fn, but it will give you a different vector depending on which basis you pick, right? Different choice of bases will give us different vectors in Fn representing the same vector in V. Okay, so here, let's do an example. So here's a vector, a finite dimensional vector space. Take the vector space V given by all of the vectors X, Y, Z in R3, such that X plus two Y minus Z is equal to zero. Right? So this is the solutions of a homogeneous system of linear equations. In this case, the system only has one equation. And because it's the, uh, the solution set of a homogeneous linear equation, we know that it is a subspace, right? In fact, this is a two-dimensional subspace of R3, right? And because it's two-dimensional vector space over R, it is isomorphic to R2, right? So we saw that for a given dimension and a given field, there is only one vector space up to isomorphism. So every two-dimensional vector space over the real numbers is isomorphic to R2, right? So that means that there's some linear way of identifying with R2, but of course there could be more than one way. In fact, there are. There's gonna be one way, one identification with R2 for every choice of basis of V. So for example, one basis of V is, take the vectors zero, one, two, and the vector two, one, four. Right, so we can check that if you plug them in to this equation, you get zero. And just by staring at them, it's obvious that this is a linearly independent set, right? Uh, actually, let me use round parentheses to emphasize that it's a list, the order matters. Okay. One basis for it is this, and then since we can write any vector in V as a linear combination of these two vectors, in a unique way, we get a way to represent vectors in V by vectors in R2, right? We just keep track of the coefficients. So for example, so let's take any vector inside this set. For example, we could take the vector V 
to be 1, 0, 1. All right? This is an element of this vector space because it satisfies this equation. Okay? Because it is a vector in this vector space, I know that I can write it in terms of this basis. I just have to find coefficients. But there is a unique choice of coefficients that will write this vector as a linear combination of these vectors. Right? So in this case, this vector v is equal to minus 1 half times this first vector, 0, 1, 2 and then plus one half times this vector two, one, four. Okay, now we're only going to keep the coefficients, right? And we're gonna say that the vector V coordinates with respect to the basis B is equal to minus one half, one half. Okay, make sure you understand this example, right? If not now, then after listening to the lecture, come back and make sure you understand this example, right? So the vector space V is given to us initially as a subspace of R3, but that's nothing intrinsic to V. V is just a two-dimensional vector space of the real numbers. So as a vector space, it's isomorphic to R2, right? And we get an isomorphism every time we choose a basis. The isomorphism just says, take your vector and keep track of the coefficients when you write it in terms of this basis. Okay. Now, Vector spaces, finite dimensional vector spaces are isomorphic to Fn, where n is the dimension. So if I have a pair of vector spaces, um, well, what's special about Fn? One thing that's special about powers of the field is that when you look at linear maps between two different powers of the field, they don't have to be different, between two powers of the field, we know that that linear map is given by multiplication by a matrix. Okay, so now let's say you have two finite dimensional vector spaces, V and W. We know that V, because it's finite dimensional, is isomorphic to Fn for some n, and we know that W, because it's finite dimensional, is isomorphic to Fm for some m. So that means that every linear map between V and W, well, after we identify V with Fn and W with Fm, then our linear map gets identified with multiplication by a matrix. Right? Now, which matrix will of course depend on which bases we picked, which identifications of the vector spaces V and W we pick. But for every choice of bases, our linear map gets represented by a matrix. This is wonderful. This means that now when we're studying arbitrary linear maps between arbitrary finite dimensional vector spaces, we can use matrices, which are very concrete. Okay, let's write that down. So let's say if T is a linear map between V and W, and VW are finite dimensional vector spaces over the field R, F, then a basis, let's call it B sub V, call them V1 through Vn. For V, so this basis gives an isomorphism between V and Fn, and a basis, call it B sub W, W1 through Wm. For W, 
gives an isomorphism of W with Fm And since we know that every linear map in the linear maps between Fn and Fm is given by multiplication by a matrix, of size m by n and coefficients in f, these isomorphisms allow us to represent T as matrix multiplication. Right? So suppose for each element of the basis here for V, we have that T of Vj is equal to A1JW1 plus dot 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 plus a m j w m then the matrix of t with respect to the basis of v and the basis of W is A given by AIJ. So here I goes from one to M and J goes from one to N. We denote this matrix by T in square brackets, and then we're gonna keep track of both of the bases we used. Okay, so we start out with a linear map between V and W, right? But V and W are finite dimensional vector spaces, which means that V is isomorphic to Fn for some N and W is isomorphic to Fm for some N. So that means that the linear maps between V and W are equivalent to the linear maps between Fn and Fm, right? Which means ultimately that every linear map between Fn, between V and W is going to be given by multiplication by a matrix, right? But which matrix depends on how you identify V with Fn and W with Fm, right? We make these identifications by fixing a basis, right? As soon as we fix a basis, every vector in V is now given by a, a column vector where the, the coordinates are just the coefficients for the linear combination of that of this basis that gives you that vector, right? Okay, now, how do we find the matrix associated to a linear map? Well, when we were working always with the standard basis, our algorithm was simple. To find the jth column of A, you do A times EJ. Okay, now that's still true, of course, but now that EJ that you're multiplying, that's, that's now representing the Jth vector in this basis, right? EJ just says, take all of the coefficients equal to zero except for the Jth, which you take equal to one. So that's when you apply it to this basis, that's going to give you Vj, right? So whereas before, to find A times Ej, we would, we would evaluate T at Ej. Now, our T is defined on the vector space V. So we evaluate T on Vj. And whereas before, we would just 
evaluate T on EJ and receive a vector, a column vector with coordinates, now what we get is an element of W, right? So if we want to translate that to a column vector with coordinates, we just have to represent that vector in inside the space W using the basis that we chose for W, right? So, okay, there you go. That's how you represent it as a linear combination of the basis for W. So these coefficients, these are what we would have gotten before as a column vector. And so that's what we put in the jth column of A. And that's how we find the matrix associated, not just to the linear map, but to the linear map and the choice of bases. Okay. Now, of course, when, when we can simplify the notation, we do. So if V is equal to W and you choose the same basis, well, if you're only working with one vector space, you might not need to include that in the notation here. So then we simply write one basis here. and refer to it as the matrix of T with respect to B. Okay, and then let me write down what I said a moment ago. Just as before, We can find this matrix one column at a time. To find the jth column of the matrix associated to T with respect to the bases B, V, and B, W. We take the jth vector in BV, right? So it's VJ, say, apply T, and then express the result, right? T of VJ using the basis BW, right? So the jth column of this matrix is equal to take T of VJ and express it in the basis W. Okay. Okay. Now let's do a simple lemma. Just emphasizing how this works. So given T linear map between B and W, given a VB, a basis for V, VW, a basis for W. Let A be the matrix associated to T with respect to the bases BV and BW. For any vector u in V, we have T of u 
expressed in the basis BW is equal to A times U expressed in the basis BV. Okay. So of course, this is just saying something we've already said before, but let's go ahead and write this out in detail uh, just for pedagogical purposes. Okay, great. So let's denote the elements in, in the first basis as V1 through Vn and the elements in the second basis is W1 through Wm. And recall that the entries Aij of capital A satisfy T of Vj is equal to A1 J W one plus dot 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 up to A M J W M. Okay, so that's how we defined the matrix A. We said the matrix A is the matrix whose entries A I J participate in this equation. So if U is a vector in B and it has coordinates. U with respect to the basis B uh, has coordinates C1 through Cn, right? So let me just emphasize what that means is that U is equal to C1V1 plus dot, dot, dot up to CNVN. Then T of U, Well, T of U would be T of the sum of CJVJ. Actually, let's, yeah, CJVJ, where J goes from one to N. And because T is a linear map, it takes linear combinations to linear combinations. So I can write this as the sum J goes from one to N of CJ of T of VJ, right? Now I'm going to use this fact I know what T of Vj is. So this is the sum J goes from one to N of Cj times the sum I goes from one to M of A I J W uh, I. Okay, and now I'm going to reverse the order of the sums. First, I'm going to put the sum uh, I goes from one to M and then I'm gonna put the sum J goes from one to N. So here I'll have A, I, J, C, J, and then W, I. Okay, so I started with an arbitrary vector U. I write it in coordinates using the basis BV, right? So then when I wanna compute T of U, well, I know that it's T of this linear combination, and I expand out knowing what happens to each basis element. So then T of U ends up being this vector, right? So I have now the vector T of U written as a linear combination of the elements of the basis BW, right? So another way of saying that is to say that I've now found the coordinates for T of U in the basis BW, right? This would have as first coordinate, so this would be, right, the first coordinate would be the coefficient of W1. So the coefficient of W1 is the sum J goes from one to N of A one J C J, right? And then dot, 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 the last one will be the coefficient of WM. The coefficient of Wm is the sum j goes from 1 to n of a m j c j. Right, and now we just stare at this, 
and we recognize it as the matrix A multiplying the vector C1 through Cn. That is A multiplying the vector U expressed in the basis B, V as required. Okay, so the way we defined the matrix by specifying that these would be the coefficients, that these coefficients would be the entries, gives us this property. Okay. Okay, um, now, of course, you can go back. Given a matrix, you'll get a linear map between uh, vector spaces of the correct dimensions by choosing bases, right? So let's go ahead and make that observation. So similarly, starting with a matrix A of size M by N, coefficients in F, then for every choice of bases VV of an n-dimensional space V and VW of an m-dimensional space W, we get a linear map T. So here we decorate it with an A, B, V, B, W. This is a map that goes from V to W by prescribing. Okay, so if you take this linear map, right, with all of these decorations and you act on a vector U, inside the vector space V, then the coordinates of this with respect to the basis BW make up the vector A times U expressed with the coordinates VV. Okay. Of course, if we have repeated data, we simplify the notation, right? So we denote this map by T sub A, B, right? So just the data we need to define the map. Okay, it's worth pointing out that we can't leave anything out. We cannot leave out any part of the notation T A B V B W. Okay, so let's work out an example. So starting with this matrix, A uh, one zero zero minus one, right? So we have a, a matrix, which is just fixed with these entries. This matrix, it's two by two, gives us naturally a linear map between R2 and R2, right? So that's how we've been using it throughout the course so far. So now what we wanna point out is that actually you, you can get, because you have a map between R2 and R2, you, you get a map between any two vector spaces that you can identify with R2. But of course, what map you get depends on how you make the identification. 
So let's say you start with this and the standard bases. We get a different map. Then with what I'm going to call B op, op for opposite. So it's just going to be the same basis, but in the opposite order. So let's consider the different possibilities here. So for example, let's start with just T A B, right? So remember that's just shorthand for T A and you use the basis B twice. Now the basis B is the standard basis. So this is exactly what we're used to. Let's take a figure like this. The standard basis, we know exactly what this map does. It's going to do nothing in the X direction and it's going to switch the Y direction. Right, so this would become something like this. Okay, so this reflects across the x axis. If we do TAB up, right, which is shorthand for TA, and they use B up and be up again. Okay, so now what is this going to do? So I'm going to use the same matrix, but I'm now using this basis, right? Which means the first, look, notice here, all we've done is switch e, E1 and E2. So that means that now when I give you a vector A with coordinates uh, X, Y, the first coordinate is actually on the Y axis and the second coordinate is on the X axis. So that means that here, we're going to reflect across the y-axis. So the first coordinate is going to get switched and the second coordinate stays the same. So if we start with the same figure, then we're going to end up with something that looks like this. So this reflects across the y-axis. Okay. And now let's do one where we're switching the basis to. So let's do T, A, B, B up. Okay. So this one, let's take it a little slower uh, to figure out exactly what this does. Right? So the matrix A is this one, right? So we know that it's going to take the vector one zero to one zero, right? But it's going to take the vector one zero in the basis B and it's going to send it to the vector one zero in the basis B up. Now the first, so this is, this says the first basis vector in this basis gets sent to the first basis vector in this basis, right? So that means that E1 is going to get sent to E2. And similarly, if we look at zero one with respect to this basis B, multiply by the matrix and you end up with zero minus one. But now we interpret that as being in the basis B up. So the, this says the second vector in the basis B gets sent to minus the second vector in the basis B up, right? So that means that E2 gets sent to minus E1. Okay, so 
So great, we're going to send E1 gets sent to E2, and um, E2 gets sent to minus E1. So it's like before, if we had been multiplying um, by the matrix uh, 0, 1, minus 1, 0. which we recognize as rotation by pi over two counterclockwise. Right, so. so that means that if I start with a figure like this, I'll end up with a figure like this. So it rotates pi over two, counterclockwise. Okay, so also this means that linear maps that we might not have thought of as being given by matrix multiplication, as long as we're working between finite dimensional vector spaces, they will be, right? So here's an example, the derivative. The derivative defines a linear map. For example, if you're working on polynomials of degree at most n, and you take a derivative, you end up with a polynomial of degree at most n minus one. So if we pick bases, of these spaces of polynomials, then this map will be given by matrix multiplication, right? So this allows you when you're differentiating polynomials to just do it by multiplying with a matrix over and over. Let's say, just to be concrete, if we use the standard basis of monomials, so one x, x squared up to x to the n for the polynomials of degree at most n, and one x, x to the n minus one, for polynomials of degree at most n minus one, then D is given by the n times n minus one matrix. So you'd have zeros and then above the diagonal you have Uh, the numbers uh, going from one to uh, n. Um, here in order. Right, so for example, to find the final column, what you would do is you would take the final element of this basis, right, x to the n, you would hit it with the linear map. So in this case, we differentiate it, and we end up with n times x to the n minus one. Then we express that polynomial in terms of this basis, and that's just n times this guy, right? Well, this guy is the last element of the basis. So it's n times the last element of the basis. That's the same as, that has coordinates, 0, 0, 0, and then an n at the end. And that's how we get that last column, okay? Um, how do we get the first column? Well, you take the first element of this basis, you differentiate it, you get 0, 
And then you express that in terms of this basis. Well, that's just all zeros, right? Second vector, take the second element of this basis, differentiate it, you get one. Express that in terms of this basis. Well, that's just one times the first element. So you put a one as the first coordinate, and then you put zeros everywhere else. OK. OK. Now, if I give you a linear map, then every choice of basis for the domain and choice of basis for the codomain gives you a matrix representation. If you're free to choose these two bases, you can always arrange for your linear map to be very simple, right? So what you're doing is you're taking all of the complication that the map might be doing and you put that into the bases, right? So it makes it, it makes it so that all of the action of the map is hidden, if you like, in the choice of bases. Right. Still, it's useful to know uh, that you can do this. So let's let's write this out. It's there. Let V and W be finite dimensional vector spaces, and T a linear map between V and W. There are bases VV of V and VW of W such that the matrix A representing T with respect to these bases VV and VW has entries aij where you get one if i is equal to j less than or equal to the rank of t and zero otherwise. Remember the rank of t is the same as the dimension of its image. Okay. Okay, so the proof. Well, so we're going to use some things that we saw last time. Namely, recall from last lecture that if if you won through UL is a basis. Let me give myself more space here. U1 through UL is a basis of the kernel of T. And we extend it to a basis U1 through UL, and then V1 through VK of all of V, then T of V1 to T of VK is the basis of the range of T. Right. This is exactly how we proved the rank nullity theorem. Right, because this, this, if you like, is a stronger version of the rank nullity theorem because this is saying not just that the dimension of V is equal to the dimension of the kernel plus the dimension of the co-kernel, it's saying, in fact, every basis of the kernel extended to a basis of V produces a, a basis of the range. So now, now we have a basis of the range. Let's let's keep going. So I need I need a, a whole basis of W if I'm to express the map T 
going between V and W. So let's keep going. If we extend this, to a basis of W. So now let's say that I have TV1 up to T of VK, and then I add W1 through W capital N. Then the bases, so now I have two bases. One of these is equal to, ah, I need to change the order here. Put the V's first, V1 through VK, then U1 through UL, and VW, T of V1 up to T of VK, and then W1 up to WN. These bases have the property required. Okay, perfect. So let's stare at that. Why is that true? Well, to find the matrix associated to T with respect to the basis VV and VW, what I should do is, well, I can find this matrix one column at a time. To find the first column, I just take the first basis vector here, I hit it with T, and then I express it with respect to this basis. Okay, let's do that. I take this basis vector, I hit it with T, I get T of V1, I express that in terms of this basis. Well, that's easy, it's, it's right there. So I just get one and then followed by a bunch of zeros, right? Same thing with V2, I hit it with T, it would be right here, T of V2. So I just get the vector zero, one, zero, 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 right? And so on for the first K of these, right? And K, right, is the, um, is the rank of T because I have K vectors in a basis of the range. So for the first K, I'm just getting like an identity matrix by, by expressing the image of each of these vectors in terms of this one, right? But then once I'm done with, uh, with the first K, I just have elements of the null space of T. So all of the following columns are just gonna be zeros, right? Okay, so that proves that. And that's where the lecture stops. So next I'll give you some historical context, but feel free to stop listening now. Okay, so I thought that today I would mention a mathematician whose name is Anna, whose name was Anna Johnson Pell Wheeler. She lived from 1883 to 1966. And the name is a bit long because Anna Johnson was their birth name, but then they married uh, and took the last name Pell, and then that husband died and they married and took the last name Wheeler. So this uh, American mathematician who is known for uh, her work in um, what was then called infinite uh, dimensional linear algebra. But now what she did is known as part of functional analysis. So functional analysis is, if you like, it's like infinite dimensional linear algebra. But of course, once you start working with infinite dimensions so that you have uh, infinite sums, then you have to start worrying about convergence. And so it becomes a part of analysis. Uh, because of the convergence issues. Analysis, as you probably know, is what we call calculus, so advanced calculus. So Anna Johnson uh, studied math in South Dakota. Uh, and uh, when she was there, uh, she one of her professors was uh, called Alexander Pell. And he encouraged her to pursue uh, her studies. She graduated uh, in 1903. And then she went on to do a master's and eventually went to Germany to uh, Göttingen University, which was the best university in the world at that time for mathematics. Uh, it had been ever since uh, Gauss, 
uh, who we talked about previously, uh, was a professor there. And at this time, 1903, uh, well, a little after 1905, say, uh, Hilbert, David Hilbert was uh, there and he was one of the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century. And, um, and Anna Johnson started working with him. Um, Alexander Pell, her professor from South Dakota, uh, had, his wife had died a little after uh, Anna Johnson had graduated. And so, uh, and he and, uh, and she had kept in touch. He went to Germany in 1907 to marry her. Actually, he went there a little earlier, but she had a fellowship that didn't allow her to be married and, and keep the fellowship. Um, and so they waited until the fellowship ended and married in 1907. He went there despite putting himself at some risk by traveling to Europe because it turned out that uh, Alexander Pell was a Russian double agent. His original name was Sergei Degayev. And he had been involved with the group that assassinated Tsar um, Alexander II in 1881. Right, Alexander II, as you may know, was the Tsar who ended serfdom in, in Russia. And, um, and you might think that, that that would earn him some, some credibility with liberals, but in fact, um, it was felt that he hadn't gone far enough and there was a lot of, of radical movement in, in Russia at the time. Uh, eventually, some radicals decided that that uh, they would kill the Tsar, and this would lead to an uprising and and you know freedom and democracy and stuff. And uh, the opposite happened; they, they killed the Tsar, and there was a conservative backlash, which made things much worse in Russia than they had been when the Tsar was alive. Uh, but in any case, coming back to um, Anna Johnson, well now Anna Pell, she's married Alexander Pell. She moves back to the US. Apparently she was in some sort of fight with Hilbert. We don't know the details. So she didn't finish her PhD uh, in Göttingen. She ended up finishing it in uh, Chicago, working with E.H. Moore uh, in 1910. Uh, her thesis was entitled Biorthogonal Systems of Functions with Applications to the Theory of Integral Equations. So orthogonality is something we're going to be studying later in this course. Integral equations are like, so integrals are what replace sums when you're working with, with um, continuum, a continuum of numbers as opposed to a finite set of numbers. And so this theory of integral equations, you can think of as being like analogous to uh, systems of linear equations in infinite dimensions. Right. It's a little more complicated than that, of course, but you can look at back at some of the examples we have of linear maps involving integral kernels, and then it, it is very closely related. Uh, she was only the second woman to get a PhD in mathematics from Chicago in 1910. She faced a lot of discrimination once she was um, a mathematician. Uh, lots of universities were willing to hire uh, people with uh, worse um, uh, credentials and worse research track records because they were men. But she eventually found a, a good job at Bryn Mawr, which was uh, the first uh, women's college in the US to offer uh, PhDs. And, um, and she had a, a very um, good career there. Uh, she was the first woman to deliver the colloquium lectures of the American Mathematical Society. That happened in 1927, and wouldn't, there wouldn't be another woman to deliver them until 1980. She was also an editor of the most prestigious journal in mathematics, the Annals of Mathematics, uh, from 1927 to 1945. Uh, she was instrumental in bringing uh, a German mathematician from Göttingen, Emmy Noether, uh, to Bryn Mawr in 1933. I might tell you more about her some other time. But I'll finish by um, telling you, uh, reading you, 
uh, something that one of her former students wrote to her uh, many years later. Um, it says, dear Mrs. Wheeler, at a time like this, one can't help reminiscing various things. And then she says, um, but most of all, I remember my father's words after he met you on commencement day in 1930. The thought of his daughter aspiring to be a female mathematician was a bit horrifying to him. However, after he met you, he said, such a woman, I would like you to be. That, of course, was impossible. However, I hope I will be able to pass on to my students a bit of the feeling for mathematics, which you have given yours. And we'll stop there and pick it up next time.